just a reminder, I've touched on this a couple times already, but that there are sort of three basic forms of output, and that's it, that you can get. Um, you can reorganize it and slice it nice in different ways, but you can know the state of each cell, you can know its age, and we didn't get into it in this course, but the time since transition for any, any transition type. Um, and you can also know whether um, a cell transitions due to any one of the transition types. So attributes are basically uh, lookup tables that you can build into STSIM to calculate various metrics, indicators that are a function of one or more of those basic outputs. Um, so there's two types of attributes based on the output that we produce, as I show on the top there. <clears throat> First are called state attributes, and these are indicators that are a function essentially of the state, and by extension the age as well, but the state and age of each cell. And again, it can also be done as a function of time since transition. But whatever we do with age, you can do with any transition. You can just think of time since transition as an extension of age. So let's just say function of state and age. And transition attributes, as the title suggests, are indicators that can be a function of state and age and whether a cell transitioned or not. So I'll give you a couple examples here on the next slide. Um, this is an example of a state attribute. So this is, again, the full lands same landscape that you're working with, but 10 times larger in this exercise and also classified differently. But this is just an example of how you might calculate ha wildlife habitat. That's a typical example of a state attribute. Um, I kind of misspelled there, I'm afraid. Um, so you might have a landscape that looks something like this. This is one with 12 possible states. This might be a projection at any time in the future for any Monte Carlo. You get you know, a, a raster file out like this. And you might also know uh, the age of every cell out at some point in the future. And you can combine those that state and age information to calculate something like a habitat for every cell. So this is an example of caribou habitat in the boreal forest where caribou um, for their winter habitat, they need conifers, old conifer, essentially. That's what they need. So this is showing that these are the cells that are in this landscape that are in these conifer state classes, and these uh, minimum ages are greater. So that's kind of the, the formula we have. And then to model that, then in STSIM, what we do is we will create a table in STSIM that says um, for every cell, how you convert the state and age into a corresponding indicator or a suitability index, you can think of it. And so this example here, we're using just zeros and ones. We we're saying any cell that meets these conditions gets a value of one for the attribute and the other cells in any of the other states and any ages other than these for the conifer, we get a value of zero. And then the habitat, then metric, which would be an attribute, is just calculated as this value times the area represented by each cell. So that's that's it. You're just creating a lookup like that. That's an example. You know, these could be, they don't have to be zero ones. They could be values like that if you're trying to calculate a more classic habitat suitability index. But this would be a way of just identifying how much area in total on your landscape you have in this combination of state and age. Um, transition attributes, this is an example, a um, classic example in forestry um, circles is uh, your timber volume, how much volume you might get from doing harvest. So uh, unlike um, the state attribute, how much volume you harvest in your forest is a function not of the state, just of the standing stock of the la on the landscape or the state on the landscape. But it's more it's a function of how much how much area transitions due to harvesting. So any cell then that is harvested in a particular time step on your landscape, if you look at um, you can calculate its volume by again taking the attribute value you assign for the transition attribute 
times the area of the cell. Um, and so, for example, here, if we had a cell that was age 50 and it was in the dry um, strata, this is showing how you can involve strata in here too, then you would say that if I harvested that cell, I would calculate that that cell contributed um, 30 cubic meters per acre, or if the times the number of acres, probably represented by the cell, would give you how much volume is harvested off of that cell. And so um, in, in both state and transition attributes, you know, your attributes can be a function of, um, as I said, the state class, which by extension can involve the stratum it's in, um, and also um, the age. So that's um, that's all there is to attributes. Um, they're just a quick and easy way to build some additional uh, indicators into your model. Um, now the the one uh, limitation of attributes is that they treat each cell as being independent. So you know our our metric of habitat for caribou just summed up the total area in different states and ages and didn't take, you know, there's no way in STSIM with the attribute feature to impose some kind of spatial constraint on whether something's habitat or not. If you want to do that, you have to, you can do that kind of thing. We do it all the time, but you do it outside of STSIM in a script that you would run after the simulation was done. But this is a way to build the simple indicators into the software that you can then use. Any um, questions about that before we go into the exercise? So exercise six is just going to, um, oh, I should say one last thing. Um, you'll see in the exercise that if you create, um, up till now, uh, we've been um, creating, um, doing what are called transition targets, where we've been targeting how much area we wish to harvest um, according to area. We said we want so many acres or hectares per year. You'll see that one of the big uh, benefits of setting up transition attributes is that we can create targets in STSIM based on the amount of attribute rather than area. So if, if in this case, you'll see in the example, you'll be able to set up targets for how much volume was harvested rather than just simply about how much area was targeted, uh, you know, and rather than just how much area is harvested. Um, and that we can do once we set up these attributes and the exercise will kind of lead you through that. Um, so any questions before we start into the uh, exercise? I think um, well, this exercise is a little shorter. This is the exercise. I think this exercise is fairly um, self explanatory. But just to reiterate, because I didn't introduce it at the beginning, we had, uh, I think, a total of uh, three attributes uh, that we were two state attributes and one transition attribute. So we had two uh, state attributes that we were modeling in this exercise. One was a measure of uh, winter habitat, uh, angular winter habitat, where we said. The conditions for that were old conifer and in uh, wet ecozones or the wet strata, conifer had to be older than in the dry strata for it to be habitat. Um, and then we had another one which um, was the summer forage, which was based on very young deciduous stands. And, and for that one, we assigned actually a value per acre. Um, that we could sum up. So those are the two state attributes. Um, transition attributes, we use the, the volume. So we had what are called volume curves, 
where we know how much volume there is as a function of, of age. And again, um, we were only looking at conifer because that's the only forest type we're harvesting in this uh, model. And so, but we had differential volumes for wet and dry systems. So just a pretty typical example of how to, uh, what kinds of things you might want to model in STSIM. Um, and so if we look at uh, the results, let's look first at the scenario where you set it up, you added those attributes to your scenario, and then uh, you express the harvest as a target, still area-based target. Um, I think the question asked you to look at the timber volume that was harvested um, uh, under that scenario. So what you would have noticed is in the charts, when you went to create a chart, um, this is the big benefit of building these attributes, one of the big benefits of building them straight into STSIM rather than calculating something like habitat after you've done all your simulations as a sort of post-processing step, is you get this full integration of the habitat or the attribute calculations into the whole interface, including the charting and mapping. So it comes kind of for free. So we were able to chart um, those attributes. They appear kind of automatically. Um, we were able to do all of these. I think in the exercise, it asked you to model or to graph the summer forage as a density, right? And so we could chart those things as we've done all, all thing along. Oh, course long. Why are you not coming up? There they are. And so you get um, calculations or results that show something like this for the amount of habitat. And of course, we can get um, variability around those as well if we turn that on. And so I think the question asked you how much harvest where you it was the average volume and so once the harvest kicked on in the year 2014 seems to be at about 200,000 cubic meters per acre I think it was acres in this example again so that was the answer to that question and we can see something about the pattern of ungulate summer forage and winter habitat now can uh, anybody have any idea why um, the ungulate summer forage um, doesn't start to grow until your 2014. Any ideas why that is? No. Was there just no deciduous? Sorry, I'm jumping. No deciduous forest until then, until the. Why would there have been? That's when the harvest. Yeah, why? Isn't that when you harvest it, you get deciduous? That's what I would assume. I haven't dug into the details of it, but it must be that there's um, no uh, or, or very, very little young deciduous forest until we start bringing it on with harvest. I'm actually surprised that there's that little, but that, that would be my explanation. Yeah, I would assume why. We, if we had time, we could drill again, you know, using the charting, we could drill in and look at the, I mean, quickly, we could create a chart of the uh, deciduous forest, and I mean, we could do that almost instantly, but really, we want to look at the stuff that's young. I mean, yeah, you're seeing there's very little deciduous here early on, so we must have started the simulations with no deciduous, and it's never having a chance to build up until we start bringing in the heavy harvest. Um, so what was the other question? Is the ungular winter habitat increase or decrease? I think I just answered that. <laughs> I was asking you the answer to the question, right? Um, I have to read my questions in advance a little bit better. Um, and we can get some measure of the pounds per acre, which looks to be about 150 pounds per acre, which I think if you look back, well, anyway, that uh, I checked it, that kind of makes sense. So that was the first part of the questions. And then we went on and we created another simulation where we 
targeted a certain volume of harvest instead of an area um, using the transition attributes. So that's um, where you no, I didn't want to run it. Sorry, I have the results. Um, and so that's the second benefit of using attributes, at least transition attributes, is that they can become part of your simulation. So this is uh, one way that you could dynamically change, um, make your targets responsive to something that's going on in the landscape. In this case, how much um, available timber there is. I, I can't really think of other uses. Leo, can you think of any other um, ways we've used um, volume, uh, not volume, um, transition targets other than for harvest volume? Are there other examples? Of yeah. That? So you mean like, uh, yeah, transition attribute targets? Yeah, sorry, transition attribute targets. Yeah. So one example I know, and Louis, and you do this in your models, like often you have budgets for uh, applying sort of land management actions and different land management actions, depending on where you're applying them, have different costs. So you can create like a transition attribute for a cost uh, of say applying prescribed fire and rather than targeting the total area you might have a budget to apply prescribed fire to a landscape so then you use like a cost a cost target you know if you know the cost per unit area in different um, in different kinds of state classes that's that's kind of one example I can think of sort of kind of a, a budget the other one yeah the other one that's pretty significant for us is um uh, the AUMs for livestock grazing rates. So we set the AUM, that's animal, I don't know what you guys use in Australia, but it's animal unit months. And it's the, basically the carrying capacity for the number of livestock eating on the range. And you set the AUM and we set it for summer, winter, different pastures and all that. It varies by ownership. And so the, but we do seasonal grazing. So it, it varies by season and and that is set in the attributes. The problem is, uh, just warn everyone, don't go crazy with this menu because as Colin, um, Colin and Leonardo explained to me, um, the model has to tally how much is the contribution to every one of your little cows in the pixels and is it exceed in that year the AUMs. And so it's a, long, it's a, it's a lot of computation to verify that all these incremental bites of cows <laughs> do not exceed the total AUMs on average, and so it slows down your simulation. I'm sure Leonardo and Colin would explain this much more elegantly than I did, but it's basically the idea is that it's computationally intensive. Right. Yeah, Anna? Something I was thinking about when you're looking at the, um, the amount of forage, maybe this isn't the place to do it, but can you have a climate feedback where you might get 300 pounds produced in a good year, but then you have a dry year can that reduce it? Yes. Or, you know, is there anything we, we can actually pay? Yeah, we've done that on our uh, project with sage grouse. Um, and it's the amount of forage is um, determined. So it's a time series basically for the forage. Since we have the standard precipitation and uh, index values, we know what are the droughty years and what are the wet years. And the amount of forage is a function of the standard precipitation index so it goes up and down and um, it determines how much foraging the livestock will have will commit will do on the landscape if it's a drought year versus a wet year and all that so you can do all that if you want to you just have to have the data to do it that's all yeah if you look um you know when you're setting your your values for your your attributes, right? These curves of volume or animal units or whatever it is you, you want, they can they can vary by by year, you know, by stratum, like we've done by ecozone. Um, they can sound, they can make them have uncertainty in them, all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, and once you tie into the distributions, you can also tie them into these external variables that we were showing you earlier, where distributions can be influenced by external variables. So the it goes on and on. I mean, sort of a, I mean, I, I guess this this is kind of um, a point. 
that's maybe now's the time to make it because you've been through um, all the basic features at this point is that you know if you remember the slide that suggested that we've been at this kind of stuff since the early 90s so it's closing in on it's over 25 years and the number of different hundreds of different situations of problems have been you know we've tried to address Louis Louis has been one at the forefront of a lot of those uh, yeah, he pushes the envelope on features for sure and so you know when we hit one of these things that we can't do we usually end up with a contract to add some new feature to be but at this point there's so many things that we've covered off um, the most basic kind of questions that you can think of are addressable one way or another let's say is that fair yeah, Louis? we have a Louis, yeah we, Louis would, <laughs> if it's satisfied Louis at this point then uh, but he still comes to us with new new ideas and new features every year there's something so he's pushing the envelope yeah, Leo? I was just going to say there are a couple of uh, published papers that uh, deal with that issue of the productivity that you were asking about, Anna, and, and grazing. Um, so I can um, I can point you guys to those as well. Um, the you also saw that you get you know the other benefit is you get maps of all these things. So I think it asks you to look at winter ungulate habitat. So again, once you set up these attributes, you can map them um, over time. I think it asked you for the difference. Th these are the two scenarios, one with the um, area target and one with the volume target. Of course, we found out that the area target is only 200,000 cubic meters per year instead of 250. So it's a, a lighter uh, harvest. So as you kind of would expect, you see by this pattern, there's a bit more um, habitat here when there's um, less harvest than when we apply more. Um, and of course, you know, I don't, we haven't really focused on this, but in the mapping, I think we mentioned it early on, you're always looking at one individual iteration at a time. Um, you can scroll through these and, you know, you can see the other iterations. Um, and, but, you know, generally with spatial data like this, Looking at one iteration gives you some idea of what's going on, but obviously it doesn't summarize all the uncertainty associated with these maps in any way. Um, there are some. There actually is a, a new feature, or maybe you were going to say this, Colin. Oh, go for, for it. A, just averaging across realization. So it's we developed this before, um, or just recently, so it wasn't added to the course materials. But uh, you can now sort of instead of showing a single realization, you can show maps that average. These values across realizations. Now I would have had to turn that on in the output. Yeah, for the output, you'd have to turn yeah, that on. So I, I won't be able to view them now, but if I decided, I think um, you look over here on the output options, the spatial average, that's this new tab. This is fairly recent in the last couple months, um, where you can tell it to average, generate the averages of some of these maps for you over iterations. Or, or and if you, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And, if you select the cumulative, then it's over time as well. So average over realizations and time. If you right. So you cumulative. can kind of create an average map every year over all the iterations, or you can decide to average over all years and all, all iterations. Um, and this is stuff that we've been post-processing for a long time, but we've had uh, users that wanted this to be done really quickly and easily. So this feature got added uh, very recently. Um, but we really haven't got into that. The, the other thing I just point out is getting your, your output out of STSIM. We'll show you the way we do it, which is, you know, programmatically with R. I mean, it can be any language you can run in Python, but we're going to use the command line um, after the break to get in, data in and out. And that's what we do all the time because we, we work in R. But if, you, if you're not um, experienced in R or don't want to do it that way, um, there's this export tab that we haven't really looked at that allows you to get the output out. So, for example, if I wanted to get out the maps of um, uh, my state attributes that I just generated, I think I would, I haven't done this in a while, it would dump a bunch of TIFF files into a folder for you um, that you could do, go take and do something with if you wanted. Um, again, we, you can get at it programmatically from R if you're comfortable in R. A little bit more cleanly, but this is uh, a way you can get at all your spatial and tabular output as well. 
Uh, I still do that, you know. The old guy still does that, although I have kids working for me who, you know, program in R and go grab that crap. But uh, yeah, I'm the old old guy who still does it. Yeah. yeah. There's all 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 different uh, ways that people like to use it. So that stuff's that stuff's important for sure. Um. And and the bonus question, um, you know, I think. I was looking at the bonus, it's getting a little bit repetitive. I think we keep asking you to go back and do this block harvest. I think if I were to do it again, we might add a little bit more spice to the bonus questions. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, it is what it is. Um, and so by now you should have sort of got the handle of it, I would hope. Um, now, where am I in the right place? It's got to be in the uh, transition multipliers. So you're, you're adding a bunch of these multipliers that's turning the harvest on and off. Um, it this now this time the harvest is being set by um, transition attribute targets. Uh, no, yeah, transition attribute targets, um, and the multipliers once again apply to the target, whether it's a probability or a straight target or an attribute target doesn't matter. So this is your way of shifting the harvest on and off between blocks. And just to to show you that I can. Um, Turn these two off. Let's just uh, remove those from the end. Just add this and go over here. And I set up a chart, the usual one, where it's showing my harvest moving across blocks. So here's the harvest, and it's getting its 250,000 cubic meters per year from block A, runs short on block B, gets it from CD, and on some Monte Carlos, it has trouble on E, and some it doesn't. So. Any, and I'm trying to see what I have. There's a couple of other things that I wanted to show, um, but we're at break now. I can go a little longer, we still, I think. A couple more minutes. Um, just like picking up on little things that I realized we forgot to mention as we went along during the course. Um, one last thing I'll just show you is whenever you create uh, you know, you run a scenario and you create one of these result scenarios. I think you guys have probably figured this out. Maybe, hopefully you have. That you can, um, obviously you can go in here and just delete the results. So if you run a particular scenario four or five times, you, you would end up with five sets of results. You might want to delete all but the last one. You can come in here and just delete them and get rid of them. Um, and then they're gone. Um, but you can also do that from here. You delete results and then delete all the results that have ever been generated for that scenario. Um, that's one point. Um, the other is if you do go into one of these results scenarios directly, um, as I showed you, I think earlier, it has a snapshot of all the inputs at the time the run was done. It also comes up with this, this handy um, thing here, which you would have seen also on the run monitor when you're finished to run. I think um, if I do a quick run here, uh, let's just do a quick run for... Well, and it would be more helpful if you did a run where you built in an error and you would get an error message. That's more informative, uh, but well, I would do, wouldn't want you to be less than perfect, you know. So. Well, we're not perfect because all these <laughs> things that we've been doing don't don't have... Uh, some of, have, I don't know if any of you have gotten errors on your runs, but it, 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 let's just... What could we do to, to do an error? Um, I don't know how to create an error. I'm, I can create them all the time when I'm not trying. Uh, but if you do get an error, you'll get you, you'll you'll see when you're running the um, run monitor. Like, did I just set this up to run properly before you distracted me? Um, I run. If your if your end date if your end date is zero and your start date is 2012, that gives you an error. <laughs> or you put in tw or you put in twenty for twenty years from two thousand and fourteen. That gives you an error. <laughs> okay, so some first-hand experience. So if you got an error, you'd have a big red mark here, exclamation mark, and you got this thing called a run log, right? Some of you may have seen this. I'm going on this one because this isn't a perfect run. It's got a little eye to tell you there's some information there, but it's non-fatal. And it actually, I don't know if you guys have come across this, but we got some inconsistencies in our projection information in our spatial files. So it keeps telling me that. So it gives me a log of the run um, and what the errors were and, and uh, something you can debug off of. Um, but that log, you can get to it as well after the run is done. 
by clicking on this button in the results scenario, you get back to the logs for every run. So those records are kept. And believe me, when you make errors, you're gonna you're gonna dearly value that run log because it's the only way for you to figure out where you how you screwed up. So. And, and like all software, sometimes the messages are a little cryptic. We we work away at it. Um, but uh, I don't think they're too bad these days. They're not like they were in the early days. <laughs> bad input. I think that was probably our starting point for our run log. Uh, 